Welcome to Revitalize and Replant with Mark Clifton, where we equip pastors to take their churches from declining to thriving by pointing them to a new future and a new hope. Join us weekly for encouragement and practical advice in your pastoring journey. Welcome back. We're delighted that you've joined us again. And uh, we're going to continue in this uh, series that we started last time talking about uh, the reasons that pastors' kids struggle. It's from uh, uh, something that Barnabas Piper wrote, and it hit home. It hit home close to yeah, it, Mark it, Clifton. Yeah, it hit and, too and I, close to Dan and yeah, me. Yeah, because we are PKs, and yeah. we did struggle as that. We Mark did. Halleck, on the yeah. other hand, yeah. you know, he's, his life is completely together. <laughs> it he is. Never completely. Had any, no never issues. Had any issues. No at issues. All. <laughs> so, so he's not really relating to all of this. But uh, last time that we were together, we talked about how Pastors' kids often struggle between people's expectations of them and Jesus' expectations, and sometimes they confuse the two or don't know the difference. And then also living on borrowed belief, being told what to believe, or or mm. and we brought this phrase up, uh, you know, don't do that because what will the people at church yeah. think? Oh, I you know, love what Barnabas thing. wrote when he in that article. He said, "It's like they have a whole pantry of belief, but they don't know how to cook a meal." Right. Exactly. That's a, that's a great that's really, picture yeah, of that. So go is. back and listen to that episode, and yeah. then here we are with the day. Three more reasons pastor kids struggle. This one, this point that that we're about to bring up is probably one of those issues that um, sometimes is just a convenience thing, hmm. and that is that uh, there's no room for questions. And it's like if you have a question and your mom or your dad say, you know what, you know what, go ask your mom. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, your yeah, dad. yeah, yeah, yeah. Or uh, you know. Let me get back with you on that. Yep. Well, let's talk about that later. And it's just basically no room for questions. Yeah, and sometimes a, a, a preacher's kid doesn't feel the freedom right. to ask a question yeah. exactly. that indicates any kind of doubt about what he or she believes. Or challenge. Or yep. challenge. You know, or it's, challenge. It's yeah. like, a, well, why? Right. You know, why can I not Every do this? teenager, every middle schooler has is pushing back on authority. Sure. So why, you know, we said last time— uh, we 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 had to mark. I I completely just flayed my life and laid it out in front of everybody last time. All my hurts, all my yeah. sorrows, all my I will tell you all this, my tragedy. There was a little puddle on the floor. There was, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, because it, we had to call cleanup. If you, in aisle if you missed last week, yep. uh, as a sixth grader, uh, my my uh, my PE class in my public school was learning to square dance, and I had to go to school with a note. To my PE teacher saying that I don't dance, and I had to mm. sit on the floor while everybody else square danced. <laughs> well, the truth of the matter is, you don't. I still don't dance. Yeah, 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 That's yeah. true. But but my point is, yeah. you know, I, I asked my parents. They said, "Well, we're going to send a note with you because we don't want you dancing." How embarrassing that was to mm-hmm. a sixth grader. Yeah. And so I remember specifically in the kitchen saying, "Well, why not?" And my only answer I got was, "Well, you're the preacher's kid, and a lot of our church members Baptists don't dance, and so you're, you're not going to dance." I did not feel the freedom at all to push back and say, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, why is that? Yeah. Right. I, I didn't feel the openness to do that yeah, at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. wasn't given that openness. It was like, no. that's the way it is, so just be quiet and deal with it. Mm-hmm. And if you don't give them a sense that, hey, you can ask any questions you that's want. There right. are no bad questions. That's right. You know, you know if you've got questions about, about transgender relationships ask them if you got yeah. questions about homosexual marriage ask them if you if you want to yeah. know uh, about other religions ask them yeah but many times i think preachers kids do not feel the freedom to mm-hmm. question their faith to question their parents belief system yeah and what's the result of that mark yeah well they man they don't own their faith i mean let me just share a story you guys know and i've shared a little bit of this before so my son eli who's a senior in high school he uh he out of the blue, um, was diagnosed with cancer when he was 13 years old. And this kid, <clears throat> and I have a great relationship with my son. We're a lot alike. We love sports. We laugh a lot. And I will just tell you, up to that point, you know, my son had had perfect health, and he was just, you know, your average kid. And um, that year was the hardest year of our life. Uh, we lived in the hospital for three months, my wife and I and Eli. Um, and just seeing your son... You know, I mean, just, you know, just everything that goes with chemo. And it was awful. It was awful. But after we got through that three months and then back home for three months and then the next year, I could tell that, you know, he he obviously had been changed. I mean, he was um, 
his joy wasn't the same. Mm. And there was a, a heaviness. <clears throat> and I could tell, for instance, we were doing family worship one night, and um, and he used to love doing that, and he just started crying, and he got up and ran to his room. Wow. And, and uh, my wife and I are looking at each other and— you know, because um, with all of this, we're thinking, man, this is so hard, but the Lord's with us. He's going to get us through this. And I remember going up and, and sitting with Eli and he said, Dad, I just I don't understand. I don't. It's hard for me to believe that God really loves me, mm. um, that he would um, have me go through this um, cancer, that he would give me cancer. That's what he said, mm-hmm. that he would give me cancer. And it really scares me because I thought God really loved me. Mm. And you're listening to this, your Mm -hmm. 13-year-old son. And and that sparked many conversations. And I said, Bud, I'm so glad you're sharing this. And I love you. And and this is good to talk about this. But here's the thing he said. He goes, Dad, I love you so much. I didn't – because I would say, Bud, I want you to feel free to ask questions. He said, well, I just – I don't want to hurt your feelings. Uh Yeah. I don't want to hurt your feelings, Dad, because I don't because I know that God's so important to you, and this is and I don't I don't want to hurt your feelings. So this is like it was an angle on a pastor's kid that has a really good relationship with their dad, right? Um, who in in for me hearing that, well, one you can just imagine, like, oh my gosh, mm-hmm. but needing to go the extra mile and say, Bud, you're not going to hurt my feelings. I love you. The Lord loves you. We, we can talk about all this stuff, and I want you to feel free. It was kind of a breakthrough moment sure. that we began to then have some conversations about suffering, about pain, about why do bad things happen to good people, you know, all these the big questions that we hadn't before. But I think what I learned from that is, um, in this case, it wasn't that my, my son was just angry with God. It's that uh, he didn't he didn't necessarily feel the freedom to talk about those things because he didn't want to hurt mom and dad, mm. yeah. you know? And so mom and dad then need to communicate yeah. overboard, but we can talk about these. Oh things. man, you can ask you, these you, you, there has to be room. Eli's doing well. Yeah. And the good news is by God's grace, yeah, yeah. Eli's doing great yeah. now. Yeah. Um, but that's been a five year, not only a physical journey, but a faith journey for our son, you know, so it continues it, to be again, whether it's, whether it's, you you don't your kids don't feel comfortable asking questions because they feel like you're maybe sort of a legalistic environment, or they don't feel comfortable asking questions because they don't want to hurt you. Yep. You've got to create an environment where your preacher's kids, your kids, are free to ask any questions they want. That's right. That's right. And part of that is your facial expression when they ask them. Yep. Be be open to it. Be yeah. agreeable to it. And look, they're going to push you. Yep. They're, they're gonna they're gonna ask you questions that are gonna make you uncomfortable. That's what kids do, yeah, right? Yeah. But if they're doing that, you know they trust you, and you know they're 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 owning their faith, mm-hmm. which is sometimes it, 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 as a pastor, as a, it's more comfortable if we don't do that, and we yeah. just get them out the door at the senior in high school, and whoo, you know, they kept them off drugs, yeah. and we right, get them right, out yeah, of trouble, yeah. and then they get out there, and what do they do? Yeah. They they completely lose yep. it because it yep. wasn't their faith. So yep. no room for questions. Okay, here's number four, guys. No room for failure. No room for failure. So no room for questions. Right. Right. No room for failure. In other words, a lot of PKs feel this constant under the spotlight. I can do no wrong. And Clifton, you've talked about this yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Um, talk about that. And, and, and Dan, you could speak to this too. <coughs> Excuse me. I just had to cough. Um, well, thanks for letting us know, because we wouldn't have known what that was. <laughs> yeah. Well, there are listeners going, what was that? <laughs> okay, all right. What happened? That sounded like well, something here at the we're, zoo. We're doing a GoFundMe for a cough button. <laughs> <laughs> it cost about 45 bucks, so yeah. we don't have one. Um, uh, we're talking about the, the issue of, like, uh, PKs sometimes feel like there's no room for failure. I, I can't tell you, when I, I left home at 14, the relief I had. Uh, when I got away, got back to the United States, my parents were still in Honduras, and I got back, and I was pretty much on my own ever since. Uh, but that sense of relief that uh, it didn't matter now, yeah. that nobody was going to tell me that I couldn't do something, or, well, they did, you know, because mm. they ended up in reform school. But... Uh, <laughs> 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 and then imagine telling my parents that I got kicked out. You know, yeah. that was... Uh, <laughs> but... Um, 
but the point being that it was a relief that I didn't have to live up to a standard or um, a success rate. Mm. Yeah. You know, I think that's that became very um, instrumental in my life later on in life as God really began to deal with me and, and in dealing with the issues of success, personal success, and defining strategies for personal success, and actually teaching seminars on, on personal success. And, and it was something that was so important to me to learn t- to succeed because I had never really understood what success is. Mm-hmm. I had been told what success is. Yeah. You do this, you do this, you do this, you know, then you, you are successful. Right, you're, right, you're, right. You're, a, you're a good Christian if yeah, you do all yeah. of these things. But later on, it was like, uh, and so there was no room for failure at that mm. point. You weren't allowed to fail. And you really, the truth of the matter is you don't succeed until you fail. And in Barnabas' Piper, in his article about no room for failure, he says it so succinctly. We all sin. Mm-hmm. No. We all fail. Yep. I mean, we all disappoint people. Every single one of us. That's right. Right? Yep. So as a preacher's kid, you're going to fail. You're going to sin. You're going to disappoint people. But often we live in an environment where we don't feel like we have the same grace given to us mm. as to other kids who fail and mess up. We're, we're held to a higher, not a, not a higher standard of grace that Christ would give us, but yeah, yeah. The, the, the church culture holds us to a higher standard. Well, I remember thinking a lot of times that I had friends who, 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 who were not PKs, and they would fail or there'd be some big mess up in their life, and their parents would ignore them. And I thought, oh, that would be awesome. <laughs> <You know? laughs> because I didn't get ignored. I got yeah, judged. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. Well, I, I think too often there's an atmosphere, P- Piper says here, where, where PKs live that, uh, so what, what happens when you mess up? Where do they go when you're struggling with doubt? Where do you go when you blow it? Yeah. I mean, you, you, you may not even feel free going to your parents and saying, man, I'm struggling with Mm-hmm. You know, as a, as a kid, as, as a young man or even young woman, you know, I'm struggling with pornography. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm struggling with some stuff on text that I shouldn't be saying yep. and shouldn't be hearing and that kind of thing. A lot of times PKs have no – there's no room for failure. You, yeah. you, can, you can't go acknowledge that because, right. again, you're a PK. You shouldn't be doing that. Every teenager struggles with sin. Yeah. Every teenager struggles right. with these That's things. That's right. That's right. And, and do, you, do you have this environment where they know – I mean, when Jesus – was walking on the water, and Peter said, if it's you, bid me come. Hmm. Well, come on. Yeah. And what happened when he went? Yep. He failed. He fell, yeah. Did Jesus scold him? He, he, he reached down and picked him up and yeah. carried him back to the boat. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, there's plenty of room for failure in the Christian life. You need to teach your children that it's all about redemption. It's all about forgiveness. Yes. And you've got to confess those sins and acknowledge those sins. And again, I think sometimes PKs feel like, I can't fail. If I mm-hmm. fail, I'll let my parents down. Yep, yep, I'll yep. let my church down. So yep. I got to hide all of that stuff. That's right. And and even if the Lord forgives me, that old lady's not going to forgive me. That's right. That deacon's That's right. not going to forgive yep. me. Right. And that living with that kind of pressure just oh, makes man. you resent the church entirely because it's not about grace anymore. No. It's about being perfect. And you know what? It sucks the joy. I mean, our kids then don't get to experience the joy of the Lord, man. No. You know, they don't get to experience the joy of the gospel. That's what I want from my son. That's what I want from my daughter. It's what I want for your granddaughter is to know the joy of the Lord, just like we want that for everyone else. And the only way they're going to find that is if they experience the grace of the gospel. And to sum it all up in this statement, which is we're looking at number, uh, as we're looking at five of these, uh, this is uh, number four, no room for failure. Uh, Barnabas Piper says this, few things feed the fire of doubt like guilt and shame. Mm. When grace is absent, guilt and shame flourish. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yep. And That's... you go underground. And you go underground with your mm-hmm. sin. You know, I was never guilty in public. Wow. Mm. You, know, uh, you know, as a preacher's kid, I never, I never lived out my guilt in public. It was always underground. Mm. It was always in the dark. You know, nobody right. knew. Yep. Mm. Yep. Yep. All right. The last one, number five, an undefined identity. You know, I mean, I, I can relate to that. Um, are we who we are? Are we who our parents are? How do we find our identity? We, our identity has been determined for us the day we were born. Yeah. Oh, the pastor's wife had a new baby. Mm-hmm. Do you know how many times as a young kid— I was told you're going to be a preacher just like your dad, right? Uh, um, wow, yeah. It, 
I didn't ever resent that, but I know a lot of my peers have. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I know people mean well when they say that, but that's like, that's your identity even before you're nine, right? Even before you're eight, you're going to be a preacher just like your dad. If you, if you do something in vacation Bible school that's halfway decent, you know, you're, you're going to be a preacher just like your dad. So. Well, don't you, don't you think, too, that uh, for a long time you did disappoint your dad? You know, even though you, um, you were trying to, to satisfy. Well, I disappointed him every time you and I got together. Because <laughs> he would tell me, Clifton, Mark, he'd say, Mark, you didn't call me Clifton. He'd say, Mark, are you with Dan again? And, well, I don't, I don't, Hanging out with that kid. I don't, I don't know. Because Dan was a hippie. I mean, he, he was a hippie, a little older than me. Didn't think he was a good influence on me. I wasn't. Uh, you weren't, you know. actually. But yeah, here's, the, here's yeah. the interesting thing, though. I, by that point, I was saved. Yes, you know, you were, and so, and I was growing in the Lord. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And that's why it was a bad influence because I was excited about the Lord. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Well, yeah. what, well, Piper, here's what Piper said. This is so good. He says so many PKs define themselves by what they're expected to be. Others define themselves by what they refuse to be. Now, what what do you think that means? And then many others, he says, waffle between identities, trying to figure out what to be. Okay, so you got a preacher's kid. You're a preacher. You got a kid, and his identity is in what he's expected to be, yep. or or what they refuse to be. And so, part of this depends. If you're a good rule follower, you know how to play the part. So you'll do what's expected. Well, of you'll you. do what's expected, and that's so, how you define uh, yourself. Yep. And you that may was be me. completely. I mean, you may be empty on the inside, and it's all fake. But you know how to. And a lot of it's driven by uh, fear of man, people yep. pleasing. Yep. And you're you get to be really good at it. But a genuine, authentic relationship with the Lord is absent. Others go the other way and say, forget this, man. I'm not trying to follow these rules. And so I refuse to be what these people want me to be. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And so that's the rebel. And so both are lost. I mean, here's the deal. It's the, it's the story of the prodigal son. It is, you isn't know? it? The story of the prodigal son. Both sons in that story are lost. They're just lost for different reasons. Mm-hmm. You know, The older brother is the legalist. He knows how to follow the rules. He's the he, the one that he's expected to be, and he's missing the joy of the father. And 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 then the rebel son is just is lost, but he's lost because he refuses to be what his father wants him to be. Well, I will tell you that as as a boy growing up, and and this this was such a turning point in my conversion at my conversion, and that is I saw I grew up in the church and I saw the reality of the unreality of their faith. Wow. You know, I saw that in people's lives. I saw the fake. I saw the, you know, the the acting. I saw the I'm one person on Sunday and I'm a different person on on Wednesday. And and you know, and I I saw it. Yeah. You know, and I will tell you pastors, your kids see it too. They do. Mm-hmm. They see it and they know it. And when I got saved, the one thing I remember so clearly telling the Lord is I don't want to fake it. You know, mm. I'm not going to fake it. If this isn't real, yeah. you know, just know I'm out. Yep. It better be real or, or I'm, yep. I'm done for, yep. you know, on this. Well, pastors, two 20-minute podcasts aren't going to be enough, but we did a link, Barnabas Piper's article. You should look at that. Lean into other pastors. Lean into people for help. Um, raising your children, it's, the one, it's one of the main reasons Satan's going to attack you through your family. Yeah. Um, but just to go back and, and look at the five reasons pastors' kids struggle. People's expectations versus Jesus' expectations. Borrowed belief. It's just dumped on them. No room for questions. I don't feel the freedom to question anything. No room for failure. I don't feel the freedom to admit my failure. And then I don't have a defined identity. You know, I'm either identified by what I do or what I don't do, mm. but who am I? And I think we have to understand that Every preacher's kid struggles with this, yeah. and uh, it's not easy to be a pastor and raise a family, and so you can't do it on your own. Yeah. Lean into the gospel, lean into Christ, ask him to lead you, and then by all means acknowledge your failures. I, the, 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 the guys, the most, the most powerful memory I have of my dad, my dad hardly ever lost his temper. I mean, rarely, and Living with my mom, I'm not sure how that it didn't happen more often, but that's another story of another day. But he rarely lost his temper, all right? But once in a while, he would. And sometimes you could just tell. It was just the frustration of ministry and pastoring and money. We were always tight on money, and it would just get to him sometimes. And he would, he would maybe – he never did anything other than maybe raise his voice a little bit and, and you know, kind of lash out verbally about something. And 
But he would always, every single time, he would call all of us into the living room, my sisters, my, my mother, and me, and he would publicly confess. Mm. And usually he would weep. Mm-hmm. And then we would see him get on his knees wow. out at the couch and ask God to forgive him for not being the father and the husband he was supposed to be. I saw that many times. Wow. Mm-hmm. You have, as a pastor, let your, peop- let your family know you're not perfect. Mm-hmm. And you, you need forgiveness, too. Yeah. Model for them that. And that's maybe the most important thing you can do. I want to I just bring this to a conclusion by saying this in this last point, an undefined identity help your children to discover their identity in Christ. Yes. You know, not based on what the church thinks, not based on what you think, but what Christ thinks. What is your identity? Who are you in Christ? If that becomes the foundation, your kids will begin to discover a whole new life Mm -hmm. uh, for themselves, and it will last. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Uh, This session and the last session, as we talked about reasons pastors' kids struggle, and we hope you'll go over and listen to it again and again and again. It will make a difference, I promise you, in your family's life. Join us again for our next episode as we continue with more of Revitalize and Replant. And I hate to interrupt you, but this is a good podcast to share with your church family Mm -hmm. so they understand your kids. That's a very good point. Yeah, send this off and, and say, hey, deacons, because deacons kids, same way many times, That's absolutely or staff great. members. Yep. But even so, just let your normal, everyday yep. church yep. members say, you know, you want to pray for me? They'll often say, how can I pray for you? Pray for my family. And by the way, listen to these two podcasts. They'll really help you know what we, yes. how we need to pray. Good. That'd be good. Great. Thanks for joining us today on Revitalize and Replant. This podcast is brought to you by the North American Mission Board, where we help dying or struggling churches regain health for the glory of God and the good of their communities. If you found this conversation helpful, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. To learn more about becoming a replanting pastor or to explore resources about revitalization for your own church, visit churchreplanters.com.